we undertake population-based research to identify and address the unmet health needs of women right across the lifespan. We also undertake clinical trials to address the efficacy and safety of novel therapies. We have unique expertise in sex hormone action, depletion and replacement. And my group's particularly internationally recognized for leading the field of research in the area of testosterone in women. Importantly, we take a holistic approach to women's health research by including psychological and sociocultural aspects in our studies, as well as biological changes, and taking a life course approach to the study of women's health. The Women's Health Research Program within the School of Public Health and Preventative Medicine at Monash University is one of our premier research programs. Our school is all about excellent research, uh, excellent education and excellent advocacy and really tries to also create capacity by developing the next researchers that are going to find those key answers for those problems that we're trying to address now and into the future. We develop a stepwise approach that starts with comprehensive systematic reviews and meta-analysis that identify knowledge gaps and these inform our last comprehensive community-based observational studies that in turn inform randomized clinical trials. Management of menopause completely went off the radar a number of years ago when hormone replacement therapy was linked to breast cancer. Our research has really led to reinstatement of menopausal medicine into mainstream health care. It shows that one in three women have moderate to severe hot flushes and night sweats, that these are associated with depression and anxiety, and that women suffering symptoms also experience impaired work performance and impaired quality of life. We developed an internationally applicable, evidence-based practitioner toolkit for managing menopause to guide the treatment of women at midlife and the prescription of HRT and menopause care. There's been a bit of a misunderstanding in the world of menopausal medicine that women who live in low-income countries actually don't experience symptoms of the menopause and problems with the menopause in the same way that women living in higher income countries do. The research that's come out of the Women's Health Research Program has shown us that their experience of the menopause is largely the same. They may not be heard as loudly in some places as others, and they may not be able to afford to seek help in some places as they can in others. But the basic understanding of what happens to women at the menopause is the same worldwide. We recruited more than 10,000 participants who completed validated questionnaire of female sexual function, and also we measure sex hormone uh, by gold standard methods. And this enabled us to report for the first time the prevalence of sexual function. We found that low sexual desire increases from 31% of 20 year olds to 89% of women in their late 70s. While sexually associated distress affects an alarming 50% of younger women. But then it declines across the lifespan to 9% of 75 to 79 year olds. Notably, the combination of low sexual desire with distress or what's described as hypoactive sexual desire dysfunction peaks in women at midlife, affecting one in three women aged 40 to 44. We've conducted large randomized placebo-controlled trials of testosterone given as a patch, a gel, an implant, and as a cream in postmenopausal, premenopausal women and women with depression. We have more recently put our research in context of the published literature by undertaking an exhaustive systematic review and meta-analysis of all the published and unpublished clinical trials of testosterone in women. Although we knew a bit about testosterone, guidelines on how to use it were few and far between. And that paper has been a triumph, not only because it spreads good clinical data to clinicians all over the world, but it also establishes a place for the use of testosterone in postmenopausal women, a place that was neglected in the past. In my role as president of the International Menopause Society, I was able to bring together the leading organisations involved in women's health care. 
ACOG, the US Endocrine Society, the Royal College of Obstetrics and Gynecology, and the International Latin American, Asia Pacific, North American, and European Menopause Societies. And we generated a harmonized global position consensus statement on the use of testosterone in women to develop one agreed upon statement that will guide clinical practice around the world. She's translated both epidemiologic and basic science research into operational statements and global strategies for the management of symptoms and medical problems. And I think she's been an inspiration both as a researcher, a teacher, a mentor, and a peer collaborator. And we're hoping that her leadership and the promotion of the important messages of global statement will in fact lead other countries in both developed and in the undeveloped world to developing similar products that can be licensed and available for women everywhere. I think the most impactful thing I've done in the last five years was leading the global position statement on testosterone for women because this addressed an unmet need. It also brought together international societies that may never have worked together before. And I think it's an incredibly important model. We can just harmonize our knowledge and give internationally agreed upon and shared information translated into guidelines for clinical care.